Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we're on the lower shell handling deck of turret number two, and we're finally going to talk about the different types of 16-inch shells that uh, Battleship New Jersey could have fired. Uh, we've gotten this question a ton of times, uh, including when we were over at uh, Battleship North Carolina the other week. They still use the same size shells, yeah, I can never remember the marks off the top of my head either. But yes, all of the American battleships, even the older like Colorado, Maryland, West Virginia, use the same size um, One of our guests who showed up to see us was specifically asking about, well, there were older types of 16-inch shells. Could these fire those? Could those fire the, the types that we fired? And uh, so since then, I've done some research and we're just gonna do a video on all of the different types of shells these guns fired. First off, they come in two separate flavors and everything else we talk about is just gonna be a variation of one or to other. So we've got a Mark 8 armor piercing shell and we've got a Mark 13 high capacity round. Um, the high capacity round is probably better known as a high explosive. That's the one that explodes on impact. Whereas the armor piercing one has a 0 0.033 second time delay fuse, which gives it enough time to punch through armor and then explode before it punches completely through a target. So right now you're seeing fiberglass replicas of the two types here. This one painted black and yellow is a replica of an AP shell. The AP shells are painted black and the yellow stripe at the top tells you what sort of explosive is inside. These would have about a 35 pound bursting charge and uh, explosive D is the compound. So all the shells with explosive D have a yellow band painted around the top. So besides the paint job, you can tell from looking at these fiberglass replicas. Uh, so first off, the Mark 8s should be six feet tall, and the Mark 13s should be five feet tall, roughly. Uh, our fiberglass replicas are all the same height. It was just easier to cast them that way, but they do look differently. So the, the AP ones, you can see a band right here, and they go up to a point. That's because this 2,700 pound projectile is actually shaped like a bullet. It's got a rounded nose under there, which is great for punching through armor, particularly deck armor. So this big uh, pointy cap on top, the nose cap, is, is just an aerodynamic windscreen. Meanwhile, the Mark 13s uh, are actually shell-shaped, conical. And they've got, uh, you'll notice, this notch on the top. That is because both of these shells have a base detonating fuse, which means when they hit something, there's, there's a timer that goes off that'll set them off. The high explosive also has a fuse on the nose, which is what this is uh, showing. Now you can fire this with either or both installed, but basically nose fuse means it hits the target and explodes like that uh, from contact from the nose. Base detonating means it hits the contact and the shell coming to an abrupt stop causes the base to detonate or set a timer, as is the case with the detonator in the AP round. Simple, so that's why they're cast a little bit differently. So, the bulk of the uh, over 1,200 of these that Nile class battleship could carry were armor piercing or high capacity shells. Uh, and what they carried specifically differed over time and we're not 100% sure what the, the mix up would have been from AP to HE. Uh, we can say with, with a, a pretty educated guess that probably during World War II there was a larger number of AP shells and then that number of projectiles decreases and the number of high capacity rounds increases over time. But I, I can't give you any numbers in 1982. It would have been X number or, or whatnot. For the Mark 8 armor piercing shell, 
there is a training round called the Mark 9. And that is what's known as a BLNP round, blind loaded and plugged. Instead of being filled with explosive D, it is filled with sand. So this whole shell body is painted blue to show that it will not explode. It is still a real shell. It still has a brass base ring so you can fire it out of the gun. So if you're firing on a target sled maybe, um, you, you would use one of these. You, you don't need an explosion. You're just trying to put a hole in a piece of paper like uh, using wad cutter rounds in your revolver. Likewise, the Mark 13 has BLMP rounds also, which are called the Mark 14 and the Mark 15. And they're pretty much the same thing. It's the same shell body. Instead of being filled with powder, it's filled with sand and painted blue. Uh, and you can tell the difference between the two because of the size. So in addition to these blue painted BLMP rounds, which are real shells just filled with sand instead of powder, there is a dummy shell. And the dummy shell is just a big brass mock-up, a solid brass mock-up of one of these. And as far as I can tell, there's only one type of that. They don't distinguish between the five inch and the, or the five foot and the six foot variety. It's just a, here is a one ton brass projectile. And that's just something the gun crew can use like sliding around the deck here to learn how they work. So I have, uh, seen it written that each turret would have had about nine or 10 practice rounds like that. And then traditionally about 130 rounds per barrel, which would have been split between the high capacity, the armor piercing, and the various blind load and, and plugged rounds. And in wartime, I suspect they were carrying less BLMP unless they were gonna be doing target practice and more actual war shots. And in peacetime, I, I suspect they never carried a full complement of anything uh, but a mix of all the different types, depending on what they were doing. Before World War II, it was the interwar period, the US Navy developed the Mark 8, which is known as a super heavy shell. And that's what makes the American 16 inch gun special. Lots of people had 16 inch guns uh, and lots of people had different caliber guns that uh, could arguably be said or better. The Italian 15 inch guns theoretically had the longest range of any of them. They use light shells and high velocity charges to get really high ranges. Uh, in practice, this isn't always work out like that, but theoretically, they excel at range. Uh, the battleship Yamato has 18 inch guns with over 3000 pounds worth of projectile uh, with the armor piercing shells. So that is a lot of stopping power right there. But Historians come back time and again to the Iowa class battleships and say that the 16 inch 50 caliber guns are the best battleship caliber guns ever made. And this is debatable. Like I said, other ships did things better. Um, the guns are very accurate. They had very long lives and they were highly developed in the post World War II age to get even longer barrel lives and better accuracy. But the thing that makes them special is the 16 inch shell. We can still parbuckle these shells around the deck. They're not too heavy for that at 2,700 pounds, but they're so dense that we can still punch holes in battleships like Yamato, even though they're running around slinging heavier shells. So the Mark 8 is a huge improvement. How big of an improvement? The earlier Mark 5 shell only weighed about 2,200 pounds. And the Mark III that that replaced, which the earlier 16 inch 45 caliber guns of the Colorado class were designed for, only weighed about 2,100 pounds. Both of these projectiles are about five feet high, like the high capacity round. With the newer fast battleships, North Carolina class, South Dakota class, and Iowa class, the shell hoists were larger and could accommodate a larger round. So by making the armor piercing projectile a foot taller, they were able to develop the Mark 8 with extra weight. So how do these weights stack up to other countries' battleships? Well, Great Britain built a 16 inch battleship, the Nelson, and that used a projectile that was right around 2000 pounds. So significantly lighter than either the Mark III, the Mark V, or especially the Mark 8. Japan 
used a 16 inch or 16 inch point one on the Nagato class. And that weighed 2,250 pounds, similar to the uh, earlier Mark III. So the Mark V were getting a heavier round and the Mark VIII were really getting a heavier round than what everyone else is using. Uh, and that plays in to the US strategy. We figure that our ships are not gonna be able to hit a target at extreme, extreme range. So there's no point in developing a high velocity weapon like uh, what the Nelson and Rodney had, or like those Italian battleships with their 15 inch guns had, the Littorio class. Plus a high velocity round is gonna wear out your rifling a lot more. We figure, you know, beyond 20 miles, we're not gonna be able to hit the target. So these have a range of about 41,000 yards at uh, 45 degrees elevation, which is about 20 nautical miles or 23 land miles. And that's kind of on the shorter end because they're going really slow at only about 2,400 feet per second. And they're really heavy. It's called the super heavy round, 2,700 pounds. That, that is a lot of freight train to send through the sky. Uh, and that was done intentionally so that our shells would have a really high, long arc that would then drop through the thinner deck armor of an enemy battleship rather than into the thick side of an enemy battleship. So these shells are optimized for plunging fire. That's why they've got the type of round bullet shaped nose. Uh, that's why they've got the low velocity and the high weight. So they go up and then they come straight back down through your deck armor. Uh, and, and they're designed to be effective at uh, pretty oblique angles as well. So whereas normal shells might hit and uh, decap at different angles and not be able to punch through, these are designed to have a little bit better performance as far as that goes. That brings us back to the Mark 13 high capacity. Why is that five foot when the shell hoist can accommodate a six foot shell like the Mark 8? Well, it was one thing to design a much better armor piercing round, but the Navy decided to standardize the Mark 13 round between uh, all of the battleships, whether it was the older Colorado class or the newer fast battleships. So they all fire the Mark 13, but only the fast battleships fire the Mark 8. The slower uh, standard type have to stick with the Mark 5s. Make sense? So older battleships with a 16 inch 45 caliber gun have a slightly shorter range than the Iowa's 41,000 yards or, or what have you, because their gun is a lower caliber. The, there is less rifling inside because it is a shorter barrel. So the gun, the shell isn't spinning as much. Ours, like throwing a football, gets up to about 70 rotations per second as it's flung out of the muzzle. And this helps it go through the air and it helps it stay on target without wobbling and going all over the place. That gets us through the main projectiles for these guns. And like I said, every other projectile is just a modification of one or the other, by and large. What I've just described is what these ships would have had during World War II. In the 1950s, the major addition is a nuclear armed projectile, or Project Katy, which is the Mark 23, 16 inch shell. Uh, they, they took a much smaller, I believe it was an 11 inch artillery projectile, which had a nuclear warhead in it. And they basically took that warhead and they either put it in an existing Mark 13 shell body, so it is a 16 inch shell, or they made a new shell, which for all intents and purposes looks the same as a Mark 13. Uh, so it's unclear whether they developed a whole new shell or if they were just able to put the warhead in an existing modified shell. Those shells, uh, there's one in existence at a museum in New Mexico, and that has a green body and a silver nose and stripe. Uh, I have also seen it with a uh, white body with a silver stripe, but I'm not sure if that's just black and white photographs throwing people off or uh, an army coloring scheme, if that was different from the Navy or what. I'm not entirely sure. All I can tell you is the only existing 16 inch nuclear shell is painted green uh, with the, the white stripe. So we, we've done a separate video on Project Katy, and there's a link in the description below. That's one of my favorite videos we've ever done because I, I feel like it answers a question that we commonly get asked. 
So there's more information on that down below, but I'll just say the real shell was a Mark 23, and because you always need to practice, that was the Mark 24. Uh, each battleship would have been armed with roughly 10 of each, 10 live shells and 10 practice shells. 50 total were made, and in the early 60s, the Iowas are no longer in service, so they're removed from the inventory. Uh, again, more about that in the other video. We did some cool research to find that information. During the Vietnam War, they were doing some interesting things with 16-inch shells. The ship was only in commission for a year, so even though a couple of research projects were opened up to come up with Sabo rounds that would have really long range for, for sure bombardment, uh, nothing really went anywhere. As far as I know, the only modifications were what I always call unauthorized ship alts, where the ship's crew made modifications. Uh, during the Vietnam War, we fired a lot of the high capacity rounds. We could fire one to create a landing zone by defoliating an entire section of jungle. And we would do all sorts of uh, bombardments with them. Well, the issue is the North Vietnamese are very smart. They're, they're very good insurgents. We start firing rounds, they leave the area, the firing stops, they come back to the area. So apparently at some point, this phenomena was uh, passed on to the ship's crew. I don't know if it was ground troops who had called in for naval gunfire support and then they don't find any bodies and then a few hours later they're being shot at again after New Jersey's no longer there, uh, or, or how this happened. I do know Captain Snyder talked to a bunch of infantry commanders and, and was always talking to people, going ashore, bringing them on his ship to show them around. So he certainly could have been told that uh, something was going on. So in this ship's own machine shop, they went through and they modified the fuses on these projectiles. Uh, one, they found that the nose detonating fuses for the 16 inch high capacity rounds, uh, when they were fired during the Vietnam War, if they hit raindrops during heavy rain, it would explode not too far outside the muzzle. So they decided, that's a problem. They've still got the base detonating fuse, so just remove the nose fuse entirely, which is something you, you can easily do. Well, maybe I can't easily do it, but a gunner's mate could easily do it. Uh, and again, they were designed with a base detonating fuse in addition to that for this very purpose, although they aren't supposed to detonate when they hit raindrops. I don't know what went wrong there. Uh, the, the second modification that they made on board that's actually a cool modification is in the ship's machine shop, they removed the base detonating fuses uh, and they put an overly long time delay fuse on it. So at the end of your fire mission where you've dropped a bunch of shells around the enemy, you then drop a couple uh, with the long delay fuse in it and maybe they uh, go off an hour later, maybe it's 24 hours later. I'm not entirely sure what, what the length was that they used, but it means that when North Vietnamese infiltrators come back into the area, they assume the ship has left, and then boom, you've got a 133 and a half pound burster charge going off. Also, uh, the North Vietnamese were very efficient at recovering duds, extracting the ammunition, and then using it to fire back. Uh, in fact, Communist uh, artillery pieces, like the mortar, are always slightly larger than American artillery pieces. So let's say we've got 81 millimeter mortars. We fire that at the North Vietnamese. Well, they've got Soviet 82 millimeter mortars. So they can drop our dud 81 millimeter round in their mortar and fire back at us. We cannot drop their dud 82 millimeter mortar in our 81 millimeter mortar tube and fire it back at them. Uh, very crafty with things like that. Uh, so if they try to extract the explosive D from this shell, while they're in the middle of that, the time delay fuse goes off and vaporizes them. As far as I know, that's a modification that was only made uh, on New Jersey shells during the Vietnam War. Uh, Project Katy was a modification only made on New Jersey, Iowa, and Wisconsin, because Missouri had already been returned to the reserve fleet at that point. Uh, but then the 1980s come around and all of these other types disappear and we go on to uh, a whole new development thread. And because the battleships were around for a little bit 
uh, for around a decade in the 80s, they did have time to develop some new stuff. So first of all, in 1981, when the Battleship Project started, they do an inventory. They found 15,500 Mark 13 high capacity shells in the inventory. They found 3,200 Mark 8 armor piercing shells in the inventory. And they found 2,300 practice shells in the inventory. The 50 uh, nuclear shells, the Mark 23s, have already been destroyed, removed from the inventory. Any other modifications have been returned to their base configurations. Uh, so these World War II manufacturer shells are the same ones that these ships are using throughout the 80s. Uh, and they're the same ones that were demilitarized and given to the various museum battleships as they're turned into museums later on. So if you come and visit our parking lot, you see a bunch of shells lying around. Those are some of these roughly 20,000 shells that were left over from the World War II manufactured inventory into the 80s. The, the ones that uh, are no longer in use by museums, I believe have been completely removed from the Navy's inventory and scrapped. Uh, the Army also had 16 inch 50 caliber guns as coastal defense that were Navy guns uh, designed after World War II um, at, that were a slightly different pattern than the kind used on Iowa class battleships. So the Army had a number of 60 inch shells in their inventory. And uh, I remember reading an article not too long ago that they are disposing of them now. So that would be by scrapping unless museums were to reach out to them and say, hey, we want this. In which case, at the museum's own expense, you'd have to go and transport them. Now, at over a ton apiece, that's kind of difficult. So I'm not sure that anybody has reached out to try and acquire those. Uh, if you're looking for a 16-inch shell, first, you've got to become a nonprofit organization, and then you might be able to reach out to the Army if they still have some and take it away at your own expense. So when we get into the 80s, they start making a bunch of new shells that uh, sort of start renumbering. So you've got Mark 143 on are these new manufactured shells. And by and large, these are all just modifications of the existing Mark 13 uh, high capacity rounds that are laying around. So first off, Mark 143 yourself, which is an HE CVT or controlled veritably timed. In the video link below, we talked about the VT fuse or the proximity fuse. This is basically just modifying the point detonating fuse with a veritably timed fuse, which means when you've got the shell in the spanner tray before you ram it into the barrel, you turn it for a specific time, and then it will detonate after that much time. Uh, this works really well with shore bombardment if you want to use it as an anti-personnel weapon because radar that it's shooting out will hit the ground and receive and explode in the air rather than making a hole in the ground. So all that shrapnel goes down on guys in foxholes instead of uh, only destroying the foxhole that it hits. Uh, I should say at this point, the US Navy did modify some of these HC rounds during World War II, time delay fuses on the nose uh, that were called HCAA rounds, any aircraft. Uh, now, I've often talked about how the Japanese Navy used an anti-aircraft shell for their main battery guns and the American Navy did not. Well, it does seem like there were some modified for that in the US Navy inventory. I have no evidence of them ever being done, but uh, I have seen range tables that show at what range and what times you're setting on these fuses. And again, you set it on the loading tray. It doesn't have a uh, fuse setter for that kind of fuse in the projectile hoist like the five inch guns have. Although there is a fuse setter in the projectile hoist. I suspect, even though they're called HCAA, that it was used for shore bombardment rather than AA, but I can't say for certain. So next we've got the Mark 144 round, which is an ICM or anti-personnel improved conventional munition. So basically uh, the Mark 44, you're putting 400 Mark 43A1 bouncing Betty hand grenades inside of the cavity of a high capacity shell in place of the 133 and a half pound burster charge. So these submunitions are scattered uh, either with an airburst or 
when it hits the ground and explodes and they bounce up. I'm not entirely sure which. Uh, and then that is a much smaller submunition that is great for anti-personnel or destroying a bunch of unarmored vehicles as opposed to uh, dropping an HC shell on one vehicle. Uh, similarly, the Mark 145 is an HEETPT round or high explosive electronic time point detonating, uh, which again, they're just modifying the fuses in this thing. They're not really modifying anything else. Then you get the Mark 46, which was a planned projectile, and I'm not sure if it was ever deployed, but that would have had 666 bomblets in it, which would have done the same thing as the, the uh, 144 with those bouncing Betty bombs. Same idea, just a different submunition on the inside. Uh, then we've got a round, which I have seen listed as the Mark 147 but I don't believe was actually ever assigned a mark designation. It was a planned round that was never developed. Uh, and this would have been a 2,240 pound HC round, uh, which would have basically been a whole new shell. They, instead of using the five foot tall HC round, they make it six feet long, like the armor piercing round. Uh, and so with this new shell, you've got a heavier shell with a heavier bursting charge, a longer range at 51,000 yards instead of the 41,000 yards that the regular one gets, and a higher velocity at uh, about 2,825 feet per second, as opposed to 2,400 feet per second for a regular. So again, that was a plan. We, we've got the shell hoist that can take these. We no longer have the older battleships that need the five foot shell, so why not make a six foot shell? And the Iowa's are decommissioned. This plan goes away around 91. Uh, likewise, the Mark 148, which is an H-E-E-R, uh, was also planned, tested, but canceled in 91 when the battleships start being decommissioned. For this, they took a 13.65 inch projectile with a Sabo on it, so it would fit in a 16 inch uh, gun. Uh, they packed it with 300 grenades, submunitions. Uh, the projectile itself was gonna be 1,300 pounds, so much lighter than normal. It was going to have a 70,000 yard range or 35 nautical miles. So significantly further than any of these because it is a subcaliber round. Uh, and it was gonna travel at 3,600 feet per second. It's lighter, it can go faster. Uh, so this is part of um, the idea of developing longer range shells for the battleships. It's a really cool idea. It would have required that the Mark 8 computers be replaced with an actual digital computer. Um, but again, as far as I know, never actually deployed on the ships. Uh, and finally, another round that doesn't have a number, but I've seen it sometimes referred to as the Mark 149. That is an H-E-E-R, again, high explosive extended range round. And this one would have only had an 11 inch diameter with a Sabo to bring it up to 16 inches so it'll fit in the gun. Uh, which di gets discarded after it leaves the muzzle. Uh, so that the round then goes down to 11 inches and it is light and can go far. In this case, uh, it goes about 100 nautical miles and uh, only weighs 650 pounds. So you are extending the battleship's reach far inland and you are creating a projectile that is much, much cheaper than a missile, which could also go that range. So why use a missile when you've got accurate uh, naval gunfire like this? And this concept is one that still exists today. The battleships have never been replaced by a cheap gun platform that can provide naval gunfire support at any distance in land. Um, so the Zumwalt class destroyers, they tried to create extended range guns, but because of the small number of ships, developing a whole new gun system for them proved to be prohibitively expensive and they have not replaced the battleship's ability to do this. Uh, really, the Navy doesn't do amphibious invasions anymore, and so we don't need this sort of shore bombardment because you can just airlift in your Army or Marine Corps uh, units well behind enemy lines. That said, something like 75 or 80 percent of the Earth's population lives within 20 miles of the ocean, so that is within the range of the battleship's guns. So maybe it is worth keeping battleships around and developing these shells. Let us know in the comment section down below. What do you think is the coolest type of shells that these ships could fire? I'd love to hear from you in the comment section.
Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. There's a link in the description for ways you can support the museum and our YouTube channel, and we appreciate your donation. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing. That way more people hear about us and learn about the work our museum is doing. Thanks for watching.